Hey everyone, how's it going? Forrest here again with another installment of my complete analysis of all of JS Bach's Kraal harmonizations. Today we're looking at Gib dich zufrieden und sei stille, which translates to be content and be still. This is an interesting chorale. Really, the harmony functions the way that we would expect, but there are some interesting choices throughout. Like, if you listen to the cadences in this chorale, they definitely have a unique sound in comparison to your regular run-of-the-mill authentic cadences, and I haven't quite put my finger on exactly why that is, but hopefully through analyzing this chorale together, we can get to the bottom of it. So let's hop into the analysis. So one sharp in the key signature, we start on E minor, we end on E minor. That's a bit interesting because Bach typically ends his minor chorales with a major tonic triad. Doesn't really have too much of an impact on the overall quality of the chorale, though. I do reckon the overall tonality of this chorale is E minor. Um, yeah, so we, we start off with our tonic triad. We then go to E, B, E, and G, which is our tonic again, no need to reanalyze. Neighbor tone in the bass, E, C, F sharp, and A is F sharp minor 7 flat 5 over E, that is 2, 4, 2. And then we get D, F sharp, which is a chord tone, G, and B. And you know, because there are 16th notes happening here, and because there really is some counterpoint going on, despite the fact that the upper voices are in this ascending pattern together, I do think what's being implied is a 5-6 chord, right? Because we can see that we have D-sharp here. Sorry if I said D-natural. D-sharp, F-sharp. We have um, B and we have A. But with the G and the C happening across from one another here over these 16th notes, we don't really quite hear it or... When we break it down on the page, it doesn't look like a 5-6 chord is happening. It looks more so like we have an augmented triad on this beat. So it is possible that we do have a 3-6-4 chord here that is augmented. That's sort of a byproduct of melodic minor. But all in all, I hear this more as a dominant triad. And it sort of makes sense that we would be able to see some type of dominant in first inversion following a 2-4-2 two, two chord. It's one of Bach's common chord progressions. And 4-2 chords are pretty typical in terms of the way that they resolve in the chorales, but after 5-6 we would expect some type of tonic triad and we get that E, G, G, and B, E minor, it's our one chord. Then we have some passing tones here in the lower voices and a non-chord tone here in the alto, F sharp, A, D sharp, and B is B7 over F sharp, which is 5-4-3, and that takes us to E minor again, G, B, E and B, which is a uh, one six. So kind of like a substitution for um, seven six. Five four three and seven six are virtually the same chord. And then we have some more non chord tones C, A, F sharp, and A leave us with um, F sharp diminished over A. That's two six. And then we get. Um, B, B, F sharp, and G. I reckon this F sharp is a suspension, or it's kind of interesting because this would be like a 5-4 suspension, which is, you know, if you, we were taking a, a counterpoint class, not really one that we would encounter all too common. It typically consists of a contrapuntal dissonance going to a consonance or two consonances going to one another, but 5 and 4 are both consonant intervals at this point in harmonic history in the West, so um, maybe that's why it makes sense. But all in all, this is what I believe to be a 1-6-4 chord, E minor over B. And um, seeing a 2 chord go to a 1 chord here, typically I'd comment on this, but because this is 1-6-4, we know that a 5 chord is coming likely afterwards, especially in a cadential situation. So 1-6-4 is basically just an intermediary chord before 5, B, B. E and F sharp, this E is another suspension, a 4-3 suspension this time, and this G is a little non-chord tone as well, but really what we're getting is a, a 5 chord, maybe even 5-7 if you want to include this little brief A here. I'm not, but you could. And then we basically cadence on E minor here. This is where I feel like the cadence is happening for all intents and purposes. However, we get a little bit of a tag here that takes us to the actual cadence, which is what I'm calling a perfect authentic cadence, but there is some potential here for a little bit of interpretation. We have after uh, during this tag, this G is a chord tone. We have E A E and uh, 
G, which does give us some potential for a little bit of a four chord. And the reason why I'm putting this in parentheses is for a couple of reasons. One is because everything's happening under a pedal tone, and pedal tones can complicate the analysis a little bit if we try to factor it into the chord, because there are chords that might be happening above the pedal tone. And uh, two, I really feel like the cadence for functional and formal purposes is ending here, so everything after this point is really just auxiliary. It's not, um, it's not uh, super integral to the analysis uh, from, like I said, the formal perspective, because it sort of feels like this is the authentic cadence that we're getting. But coincidentally, Bach does tag on another sort of authentic cadence of sorts, because after this 4-7 chord we get here, that uh, is missing the C that we would expect to see, but we have to think a little bit outside of the lines here because of the fact that we are dealing with three voices rather than a four. Um, we also have D and or D sharp and F sharp with this A here, which give us a bit of a seven chord over this E pedal that then leads us to E minor, E, G, E, and E three roots and one third as a spelling. So another potential authentic cadence formula being implied over this E tonic bass here. Kind of interesting. Haven't really encountered a, a cadence like this, so it's always exciting to see new stuff. Um, but yeah, all in all, I really feel like this is the point in which the cadence occurs, and then we tag on the last little bit of this melody here, and then we cadence on E. So this is sort of like a, like a codetta, like a very little, little coda junior. Afterwards, we get a perfect authentic cadence in the key of G major, so we're looking for a point to modulate, and I think we modulate around here. This is where it sounds like it modulates to me, but because E, ma uh, e minor and G major are so close to one another in terms of pitch content, um, really we have just a big modulation zone. It's really wherever you hear it. It's most important from, I guess, an educational standpoint is the fact that you can hear that a modulation has taken place, right? We have changed key by a certain point, but it still sounds like E minor to me for a little bit. This really looks like six, five, one to me in the uh, in the melody. So really it's around this D natural that I sort of feel like it's happening maybe a little bit before. So we have E, G, G, and C, almost like E minor, but not quite. This is C major over E, it's six, six. Little passing tone in the tenor here. You could, I guess, analyze this as uh, four, four, three as well. If you hear this A as a chord tone, but I don't, and the chords are pretty much identical to one another. You can't spell one without the other, or you can't spell four, four, three without six, six, or just six in general. Um, then we get uh, E, B, G, and B. That's E minor. So another tonic triad, a third space progression here. Kind of interesting to see one, six, one, but this is sort of a new idea anyways. So take that with a grain of salt, the fact that the one precedes the six as well. We have D natural here in the bass as well as F sharp, D natural, B, F sharp, and B. Maybe there is a passing minor dominant there. I don't really think it's too much of a, it doesn't, it's not having too much of an impact on the, on the overall harmony. This sounds more like a passing seventh to me, but Coincidentally, there is a little bit of a minor dominant that occurs here. And then we get C, B flat, E, and E, which is an incomplete C major 7 chord. That is 6, 7 in the key of E minor. Kind of interesting, this oscillation between 1 and 6 two times. And maybe that's why Bach sort of implied this passing dominant here. But in the key of G major, this is also 4, 7. I think this is where the modulation occurs. And it makes sense because C is a chord tone. A is not, and F sharp is not, and when we take an aggregate of everything, we have um, F sharp minor 7 flat 5 over C, which is 7, 4, 3. 4 going to 7 is probably the most common subdivided chord progression in all of the chorales, so it's a, it makes sense for us to sort of see this happening over a, uh, over a modulation as well, because if we were continuing to analyze in the key of uh, E minor, it looked like six going to two, and then um, two going to, uh, what would that be, like to a seven chord, which is kind of unusual. But if we see um, this seven chord, I guess in kind of an unusual fashion, we see four go to seven, and then he turns that around and just turns it into another dominant chord, which is, uh, like I mentioned, unusual. C, A, F sharp, and D, that is five, four, two. Um, D7 over C, and we would expect that to go to one in first inversion, which it does. B, B, G, 
and uh, D, G major over B, 1, 6. Sorry, the Roman numeral analysis is kind of outrunning the, um, the music on top of it a little bit. But yeah, seeing two dominant chords in succession with one another or to one another is relatively uncommon. Typically, we see a passing chord in between them. But because the seven chord is uh, happening in passing itself, um, these feel like two separate ideas, four going to seven, and then we see five going to one. Uh, typically, we would just expect to see one here. But, you know, this is what Bach's doing. We see two dominant chords next to one another. Uh, but then afterwards we get A, C, F sharp, and F sharp. Here's a really interesting chord. Uh, this is uh, F sharp diminished over A, which is 7, 6. And if you are ahead of me here, this is interesting because we have two leading tones. And yes, they are the same pitch. That's totally, you know, valid. The fact that he's matching the voice, the voices on two, um, he's matching the upper voices they're singing in a unison here the fact that there is two leading tones going on is kind of interesting because he typically goes out of his way to avoid doubling the leading tone in chords and of course this isn't as bold of a statement as hearing two leading tones in two different voices um, because of the fact that he diverges and splits the uh, melody up into C here or the melody splits because he's harmonizing this melody so the melody turns into a different tone uh, just after, but two leading tones. That's pretty interesting. Afterwards, we get G major, G, D, G, and B. Uh, one, six, seven, six, one. Very common chord progression in Bach. We see it all the time. That or the reverse, one, seven, six, one, six. It's a pattern that we see a lot in Bach, one of the monikers of his chorales for sure. But then we have an anticipation here in the uh, melody before we get C, E, G, and A, which is A minor 7 over C, 2, 6, 5. We know that Bach loves 2, 6, 5 chords, especially in cadential contexts. D, D, F sharp, and A again is our 5 chord D major with a passing 7th in the tenor. And then we get G major, G, B, D, and G, which is our tonic triad and root position. Very straightforward cadence here. Okay, looking ahead, we get another modulation. In this case, we are moving to the key of A minor in the next phrase. We have a perfect authentic cadence here. Uh, so starting off the phrase, we have um, another G major chord, G, D, G, and B. And uh, afterwards, we have a D major by the looks of it, F sharp, D, A, and A which is D major in first inversion. Let me make that five look a little bit more like a five. There we go. D and F sharp are both chord tones and briefly turn the chord back into root position. So that's something I will mark. Then we get G major, G, D, G, and B, which is our tonic triad. Again, G major, root position. Then we get a secondary leading tone here, C sharp. Then we have E, which is a non-chord tone as well. And G is a chord tone, so we don't have to mark it. But if we take the aggregate we have g c sharp e and g which is c sharp diminished over g that would be seven i guess technically six four of five because c sharp is the leading tone to d and d is our five chord and then we get d major d d f sharp and a which coincidentally i think is going to be our gateway to the key of a minor because d major is also the four chord in the key of a minor so we have some either some mode mixture, I always look at it as harmonization of melodic minor, uh, but we really don't have a lot of, um, oh, you know what, you know why it doesn't look like we have melodic minor here? It doesn't look like we have melodic minor because F sharp is already in the key signature, so when I'm looking for melodic minor, usually I use accidentals in the score, but it's already implied for us, so that's handy. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to say this D major chord is actually our four chord in the key of A minor, and uh, it makes sense because the context in which we see it being used is a pretty common one. We have this neighbor tone in the bass. Then we have D, G sharp, E, and B. We usually see four go to some type of five or seven chord in this context. In this case, it's five, four, two. And what we know about four, two chords is that it resolves, or the four, two chord typically resolves down a fifth and the bass resolves down by step. So we would expect A minor in root position or first inversion apologies c a e and c and that's true it is one six a minor over c 
and that takes us to B, A, D, and D. Pretty interesting chord here. I know that typically what Bach is implying here is a two chord of some sort, um, and it's probably a two seven chord, but I don't know whether or not it's half diminished, so I'll put that in parentheses there. You know what? What I'll do to make that a little bit easier to see is this is some type of two seven chord, but I don't know if it's too diminished. Uh, we do see melodic minor being used in this particular uh, A minor section, so it is quite possible that this could be a B minor chord or a B minor 7 chord here, but without the fifth of the chord, we just don't know, so we have to speculate. Either way, it does function the way that we would expect. It does go to E major, E, G sharp, E, and C. The C is an accent and non-chord tone here, so I reckon this is actually just 5 and then we get A minor, A, A, E, and C, and actually in kind of like a similar context that this first cadence, is, uh, cadence appears as, where we get this little tag here, it really feels like the cadence is happening here on beat three, um, but we get a repeat on beat four, and in between beat four and, um, or sorry, beat three and beat four, we have A, B, D, and B, which would be like another passing two chord, almost. I'm leery to call it a two four two chord because it, it sort of just feels like this bass note is doing the same thing this bass note is. And I think there is probably intention to that because there is some symmetry between the sections, right? The A section is probably informing the B section. It's probably more than just a coincidence that the, the cadences have this profile to them, right? So it feels like we have a two chord with this A in the bass rather than a two four two chord because the two four two chord isn't really functioning like we would expect. And again, sort of echoing what's going on here just over a shorter rhythmic period. Here we have two beats and here we have one beat. So we don't have an entire progression. We just have one kind of going to two and then back to one again. But I don't think this is really informing the cadence. I don't think this is a plagal cadence. At least it doesn't sound like a plagal cadence to me because like I said, it really feels like the cadence starts here or sorry, ends here and anything after the fact is sort of just auxiliary. But moving ahead, we are going to be working our way back towards the key of E minor. Actually, not even really working our way. We're going to be starting in the key of E minor and spending the rest of the chorale in the key of E minor. We have a half cadence here um, in the key of E minor in sort of a similar fashion to this uh, phrase as well, where we get the cadence on a beat and then it sort of happens or lags a beat behind, even though it's implied the beat before. So this A minor chord here, A, C, E and C is uh, one in the key of A minor, of course, but in the key of E minor, it's our four chord, and uh, we're going to stay in E minor for the rest of the crow. We have B, B, D sharp, and F sharp. That is our five chord, B major, and we have some uh, non-chord tones here, a passing tone in the alto and a neighbor tone in the bass before we get B, B, F sharp, and E. Now here's an interesting thing. I feel like also what's happening here is very similar to what was happening in the first phrase where we have this 5-6 chord here, but what ends up happening is that because the counterpoint is kind of ambiguous, there are a couple of different ideas that could be happening here. So I feel like this is a 5 chord that turns into 5-4-2 at this point right here. And the reason why I feel like 5-4-2 is happening here, even though we have a C happening as well, um, and an E happening here, is just because of the way that it resolves, right? Be we have the idea of this B dominant chord here, B, B, F sharp, and D sharp. But with this C happening at the same time as this A and this F sharp, there's also this idea of 7-4-3, which is kind of on the flip side what's happening here, except for instead of implying a seven chord, we have a potential three chord. That's sort of the opposite side of similarities between five and three versus five and seven. They're both a third apart, so either chord in respect to five share two tones in common. So whether there's a seven chord happening here or a five, four, two chord happening here, I feel like the way that this chord is operating functionally, it really feels like it's a 4-2 chord because of where it resolves, and that's 1-6, G, B, E, and uh, E. 
and uh, we w the fact that four, a 542 can be analyzed here and it resolves to a 16, it just makes a little bit more sense, I think. Um, even though 743 can just as easily resolve to 16, it just sort of makes sense. And really, the other tones that are being introduced to the texture, the C natural, the, the E here, um, they're all, um, like I said, additional tones. They're just adding to the texture and the counterpoint and they're just pointing in different directions, just smoothing out the resolution, which is kind of interesting though, because B very easily could have just been held as a half note here. Um, we didn't even really need a D here or an E here because we're leaping up a seventh. Um, it's kind of interesting how Bach goes against a lot of the voice leading principles that you learn about in class. Uh, but here we are seeing them um, used in an actual context and justified, so pretty cool. But yeah, 542 going to 16, that's what I feel like is happening, but there's room for argument here. It's definitely um, sort of somewhere in a spectrum between 7 and 5. But after 16, here's a pretty interesting chord. F sharp, A, F sharp, and D natural. This is um, D major over F sharp, which is 5-6. Or sorry, not 5-6. Apologies, that is a D. This would be 7 6. Not as interesting of a chord as I thought. I had a 5 written down in my notes. That's my bad. I'm not the strongest reader. Um, 1 6 happening and passing is pretty interesting because we would typically expect a leading tone chord, but here we see a uh, subtonic 7th, which is pretty cool. Um, seeing it being used as a little bit of a substitute, even though, you know, numerically speaking, seeing 1 to 7, 6 to 1 is a pretty common chord progression, E, G, G, and C. In this case, of course, Bach is switching it up, and we're not going from 1 to uh, 7 back to 1, even though the lower voices might uh, make you feel like that's the case. It's actually taking you to 6, 6, which is C major over E. 7 going to 6 is a pretty unusual chord progression. We don't see it all that often, but really no reason in theory why it couldn't be something that would come up in box writing. But afterwards we get some chromaticism here in the tenor. It's always very exciting. We have uh, D, G sharp, A, and sorry, not A, what am I talking about? Um, F sharp and B. Uh, that would be a G sharp minor 7 flat 5 chord over D which is 7, 4, 3 of 4, because G sharp's the leading tone to A, and A is our 4 currently, and that takes us to 4, 6, C, A, E, and A, 4, 6. Kind of an interesting progression all in all. It's sort of like a big third space progression. If we just look at the, um, the harmonic rhythm itself, not just the subdivisions, we have 1, 6, 4, and leading to each of these chords is a passing chord. So really the big picture is that we're just going down in thirds, and that's always cool when Bach does that. Passing tone in the bass, passing tone in the tenor, and this G is also a non-chord tone. That leaves us with B, B, E, and G. It's like a 1, 6, 4 chord. E minor over uh, B. And then we have A, A, no, A, C, A, and F sharp. That is F sharp diminished over A. That's 2, 6. We would expect that to go to some type of 5 chord, which it does. Yeah, so we just really have this one long uh, thirds progression. 1, 6, 4, 2. And we could just keep going down like 7, 5, 3, 1. Um, but that really wouldn't be the same. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to say it would be the same. I'm trying to say that chords that are a third apart don't have, they don't outline the tonal narrative that's expected of the time period. So when we see lengthy third space progressions like this, it's pretty interesting uh, because Bach, really what this is a big, it's a big scheme to get to two, which then takes us to five, which is our out to the end of the phrase, right? Because it ends in a half cadence. Um, e is a non-chord tone. Uh, B is a non-chord tone, C is a chord tone, so we don't have to mark that. But then we get B, B, F sharp, and uh, D sharp, which is our five chord. And then after these passing tones in the upper voices, we just get B major again. B, F sharp, D sharp, and B. It's kind of interesting to see a half cadence end with the root of the chord in the melody, but it's not really anything to really write home about. Typically they end with the fifth of the chord in the melody, but that's a, more of just an overall observation rather than you know, some groundbreaking thing that Bach is uh, incorporating into the harmony. I'd say this progression is infinitely more interesting than this half cadence ending with the root of the chord and the melody, but 
we are closing out at the end uh, we're, we're closing out the chorale we're nearing the end and we end with a perfect authentic cadence in the key of uh, E minor so starting off our phrase we actually end we, we start off with E major G sharp B E and uh, E which is not a major tonic it is five six of four because E also happens to be the dominant of A and uh, A is the next chord we get, A, A, E, and uh, C natural, A minor more specifically. Passing tone in the tenor here, the bass is also an A, so we don't need to re-analyze. Um, uh, we have A, C, E, and uh, B. Um, this B is, I guess, an accented passing tone or a non-chord tone. So A coincides with this F sharp here. So I think you could continue to analyze this as a four. I'm gonna say this is F sharp diminished. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to put parentheses around that. You could just um, continue along by just calling this a four chord as well. Um, all in all, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. They're basically the same chord, both in function and in pitch content. I've said that a lot in my, uh, my videos where chords that are a third apart, you know, Really, if Bach changes from a four chord to a two chord, um, it's more so the same gesture over two beats. It's almost as if he repeated the same chord, but introduces a, a tone into the texture. Maybe two if the seventh of the chord is in there. But afterwards, we get A, F sharp, D sharp, and uh, B, which is five, four, two. And we know where this would typically resolve. I mean, taking out of, uh, out of the picture the subdivision here, and just looking to the next beat, we have G, B, E, and E, which is 1, 6, E minor. So any subdivision really is overridden by where the overall trajectory of this A going down to G is. So F sharp, A, F sharp, and D sharp. I think really what's going on here is the chord is turning into a 4, 3 chord, but you could also make the argument that this is 7, uh, 6. All in all, again, the chords are a third apart, Really, Bach is um, just reiterating the idea of the dominant off of the harmonic rhythm as well. So when we see seven, we see five. We know that they're really being used interchangeably here. Um, they're both dominant functioning chords and consist of the virtually the same pitch content. Uh, but after our tonic triad, we get C, which is a non-chord tone, A, which is a non-chord tone, E, which we don't need to mark because it is a chord tone, and then A. Um, that's like A minor in first inversion, which is 4, 6. And then we get um, B, B, E, and G, which is E minor in uh, second inversion, 1, 6, 4. I think we saw the same, no, we saw 2, 6 here, but here we see 4, 6. But this idea of 1, 6 going to 1, 6, 4 over the subdivision, very much like the first phrase. This A is a neighbor tone, and then we know what we would expect here, some type of 5 chord, which is what we get, B, a, D sharp, and uh, F sharp, which is a uh, five seven, B seven in root position. We can just draw this bracket here like we did earlier. It's more so like a byproduct of, I uh, forgot that in parentheses there as well. This G is an anticipation. This E is an anticipation as well before we get E, G, B, and uh, E, which is our tonic triad root position minor this time. This chorale definitely sounds really interesting, but when you get to the brass tacks and kind of look at what's going on under the hood, really nothing out of the ordinary. Just some um, interesting harmonic choices here, like this lengthy thirds-based progression where the chords are all a third apart, and some interesting chord prolongations, like uh, we see, you know, the idea of like four going to two, or, uh, you know, seven going to five, or just these, there's room for getting really molecular with the chorale if you wanted to analyze everything in every chord for each specific instance and specify between seven chords and five chords. I don't really think it's too important unless there are two separate statements being made on the harmonic rhythm, but like something like this here where we have seven, four, three going to uh, five, four, two, it's like, you know, the chords are largely similar in their structure. They, they consist of mostly the same pitches, so really, if you see one following the other, it really is just one big gesture rather than um, the two separate chords being their own ideas. Um, 
but yeah, I think that really the big, I don't know, one of the interesting things to me is this doubled leading tone, even if it's just for an eighth note, it's pretty interesting that Bach doubles the leading tone, both the fact that both voices are singing the leading tone, maybe that means there's only one note being sung, but the fact that there was for an instant two voices singing the leading tone um, does have an impact on the harmony, and it does, it, it, it's kind of unusual, uh, but all in all, it is an instance to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, but that's really all I want to talk about with this chorale. Um, fairly straightforward, and um, hopefully it was helpful. Uh, if you're interested in following me along on the journey to analyze all of Bach's chorale harmonizations, feel free to subscribe to the channel, hit the notification icon, and like the video if you enjoyed the content. Thank you so much for watching the video and supporting the channel by doing so. I look forward to tomorrow's analysis, and I hope you take care.